So, um, as you know, hopefully, we have uh, our first midterm exam on, uh, on Thursday. That's what it says. So it's going to be right here from 3.40 to 5. Please arrive early because there's not enough space for everyone. No, I'm kidding. But, but <laughs> first come, first serve. But you, as you see, we are, we are pretty tight on space. And as I told you, I tried to get a second room, but I, my, my request was denied, unfortunately. But I think we'll, be, we'll manage. But, but just uh, you realize there's so many students, so there are a lot of logistical problems, as it is. So just uh, to make these problems a little bit easier to handle, please arrive as early as you can. Well, obviously, you can't come before 3.30 because there is not a class. But if you can arrive shortly after 3.30 and take your seats, that'll be great. Because then we'll distribute the exams so we can start exactly at 3.40. OK? Now, all the information about, about the exam is available online. And I will not go over it now. But I just want to mention a couple of things. One is about, um, about uh, what's called a cheat sheet. Um, you will be allowed to have one page, one page of formulas, standard size. Not, uh, <laughs> this is standard size. Uh, it has to be handwritten. Number one, it has to be handwritten. It cannot be typed. It cannot be a photocopy. It has to be done by you. That's the point of this. And it has to be on one side only. Not on two sides, but on one side only. If we see that somebody has two sides or a much bigger sheet of paper or something else, we'll have to confiscate it. I'm sorry, but we have to be fair to everyone. Okay? So we'll just apply the same rules. If we see that there is one which does not conform to the standards, we'll have to take it from you. Okay. Uh, no other materials are allowed. No scratch paper. If you need scratch paper later on in the exam, you, you'll ask me and I'll give you some paper. But you, there, there will be just one page of formulas on one side that you will be allowed to have. And then I will distribute we'll, with the TAs, we'll distribute the exams to you. So you'll have the exam on which you will write your solutions. Okay? Is that clear? Okay? No calculators, no books, no nothing. No, other, no scratch paper. OK. Are there any questions about the logistical aspects of the exam? Yes? Are we allowed to put examples on the cheat sheet? You can, you can write anything you want on the cheat sheet, as long as it's handwritten, as long as it's written by you, OK? Handwritten on one side, and on the standard side, a sheet of paper. OK. Um, any other questions? Hi. Um, is it going to be curved? What is going to be curved? It's a, it's more of a, it's more of a terminological question, I guess. Um, so it's a question not so much about the exam, about this midterm exam, but about the grade of, for the for the for the course, right? Because on this exam, we are not going to give you a a, a grade, a letter grade necessarily. We'll see, but. The point is that we'll just give you ra some ranges maybe for the, for the grades just to give you a ballpark, ballpark figure for the grade. Okay? You'll get the score. So it'll be, be, say, five or six problems. So it'll be, uh, say, 50 or 60 points maximum, and you'll know what your score is. And we'll give you an idea of where you are in the, you know, in the class. Okay? But of course, this score will be taken as 20% of your, of, of your final score for this course. right? And so when we get the final score, then at the end of the semester, uh, we'll, we'll look at the final scores for everybody, and we will then derive the grade. And it will be curved in the sense that there are no predetermined preset ranges. The, the ranges will depend on how everybody is doing and how the scores break. Okay? So in that sense, it is curved. Any other questions about? Yes? I'm sorry? No, if you need scratch paper, you just ask me. Because, oh, and uh, I should uh, tell you, at the, end of the, at the end of the exam, please put the, your, your uh, piece of paper, the, sh the sheet of paper in, inside the exam. So we have it, okay? I'm sorry? Can you get it back? No. <laughs> All right. Well, you will, um, if, you, uh, if you absolutely have to have it back, just write, 
I, I, need, I want to get it back. I want to keep it for posterity. All right. So now we'll talk about now we'll talk about the material for this midterm. So today is a review lecture. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to review the material, uh, and then I will. Uh, you can ask me questions. So there are various there's, there are various resources for your preparation for the for the exam, which are available online. There is um, uh, there is a mock midterm. There there are review problems. Okay. And then there are office hours also, which are organized by your, by your TAs. And this is another resource, so you can ask me questions now. There will also be office hours right after this, this, this class, right here, where you can also can continue asking me questions at that time. But first, I want to I summarize what we've done so far, and it's been five weeks. Yes, if you really have to ask me now. Okay. Oh. When? Tonight. Tonight, the answers for the previous homework uh, set, right, and for the review problems will be posted tonight uh, uh, around 6.37. 6, 6, around 6 and the mock midterm quiz? And the mock midterm quiz, no, solutions will not be posted. Okay. All right. But you can ask me about problems for mock midterm now, for example. So, um, so I want to summarize what we've done. I want to summarize what we've done in this course up to now. Okay, not necessarily in chronological order, but I want to kind of give you a, a kind of a bird's eye uh, view of the of the first five weeks of this class. And so, the most important point from my perspective to realize here is what exactly are we doing here? Okay. So we are studying various objects on the plane and in space. So in other words, the ambient space, there is ambient space, that's the space where all of those objects live, okay? And that could be, this, that's either plane, which we also denote by R2, or it's a space, and we denote by R3. And in this ambient space, we study we study objects which are one dimensional or two dimensional. That's the essence of this course. And we've done quite a, quite a bit. In this, in this vein already. So let me summarize what we've done. First, I want to talk about the one-dimensional objects. The one-dimensional objects are also known as curves. So the first, uh, the first topic that we have studied is, is, is uh, curves on the plane and in space. So in other words, curves in R2 and R3. So what, what did we talk about? What, what did we, uh, how did we study them? Well, we figured out that there were two major ways of representing curves. Okay? One is um, we can represent them in parametric form, or in other words, parametric representation. Because the curve is one dimensional, we need one extra parameter, one an extra parameter, <coughs> say t, okay, and then we write, we write, um, we represent the curve in the following way. We write each coordinate as a function of that variable, that additional variable t. So x would be some function f of t, and y would be some function g of t. If we work on the plane in R2, that's all, because we only have two coordinates, right? But if we work in space, in three-dimensional space, then we have a third coordinate. So I'll put it in brackets. That would be in case we have a third coordinate. That would be a third function. So 
So that's parametric representation. So an example of this, example of this would be say x is equal to cosine t and y is equal to sine t. It's one of the first examples we looked at. This is, I'm, I'm looking at the two-dimensional case. So there is no third coordinate. So in this case, this, is a, this represents a circle in R2 of radius 1. And uh, you see here that it's important also to, to keep track of the range of the parameter t. So if you really want to get a circle, you have to specify that t is between 0 and 2 pi, say. So then it's really a circle. Otherwise, um, in principle, you get, if you don't specify this, and as, if you allow this variable to go beyond this range, that it means that you'll have to wrap around the circle many times. So when you do parametric representation, keep track of what the limits are for this variable t. OK, so that's the first one. The second way to represent a curve is by means of, uh, of an equation. And I'll just first say Cartesian equation. in R2. In the case when the curve is, in, is on the plane, it can be represented um, by one equation with respect to the two coordinates x and y. Cartesian, Cartesian refers to the, the standard coordinate system which we, which we draw x and y because of the French uh, mathematician and philosopher Descartes who called Cartesian. So Cartesian equation in R2 example is a circle, squared plus y squared equals 1. It's the same circle as, uh, we, as the one we represented over there uh, in the parametric form can also be re represented by this one equation on the plane. OK. Note that in R3, in R3, if we are in three-dimensional space, we would need two equations, two equations. Because the dimension of the ambient space is now 3, and so to get to a curve, we have to drop the dimension by 2, so we have to impose two con constraints or two conditions, two equations. And uh, for this reason, we, don't, we usually do not use, uh, do not use this, uh, this form, this presentation, two equations. But sometimes, sometimes it happens. So an example is intersection of two surfaces. two surfaces. This is, uh, in, the, in the homework, there are a couple of exercises uh, like that, where you are given two surfaces, and they're, each surface, each is given by an equation, each is given by one equation. And so if you have intersection of two surfaces, it means that you have to impose these two equations simultaneously. When you impose these two equations simultaneously, you will describe the intersection. An intersection of two surfaces is usually a curve. So that's why a curve would be then described by two equations. So that's, that's essentially how the, this kind of pairs of equations show up, showed up in our studies so far, um, because we talked about intersections of two surfaces um, and uh, that intersection being a curve. But we'll, I'll talk about this later when, uh, when we talk about um, uh, more, more general surfaces and curves. Okay, so that's Cartesian. So usually Cartesian equations are, are in R2 because it's just one. Uh, in R3, it will be two equations, and no, normally we would just prefer to write a parametric form where you just need one parameter. It's really a matter of convenience. Okay. Now, on the plane, we also have another standard coordinate system, which is called polar coordinates. And oftentimes, um, curves uh, can be represented nicely by using polar coordinates. Polar coordinates. 
This is also in R2 on the plane. So example, I mean representing curves in polar coordinates. So an example of such a curve would be something like R equals cosine theta. Right? Which would be, uh, as we know, it's going to be a circle which is centered at one half of radius one half on the x-plane. So that's an equation, that's an equation in Cartesian, in, not in Cartesian coordinates, but in polar coordinates. So it represents a curve but using a different system of coordinates. And surely we, we have much more complicated examples. For example, you could put one plus cosine theta and it will look very different. Or you can put cosine two theta or cosine three theta and there, are, there were multiple exercises in this, in this direction in, um, in the homework. And uh, we also discussed them in class. Okay, so that's another way of representing curves on a, on a plane. Now, the next, we look at a big class of curves, which are the, the simplest curves, both in, on the plane and in space, and those are the lines. The simplest curves. In other words, up to now, I'm, we're talking about the general methods, how to represent curves. Now I'm talking about a particular, particular classes of curves. And the, the simplest class of curves is lines. And lines we learned how to represent um, in different ways. And the standard way is a parametric way, parametric representation. Parametric representation, which we write like this. R is equal to R0 plus Vt. So <clears throat> T here is a parameter. And uh, R0 is a position vector of a particular point on this, on this line, right? So here's the line. And um, so that's our zero the position vector of a particular point on this um, on this line, and v is a vector along this line. Okay, so these are the two two pieces of data that you need to. Uh, to give a coordinate representation, a parametric representation for, for a line. You need a point and you need a vector which goes along this line. Now, uh, here already we're using vectors. So this was, um, I don't want to separate this as a separate topic, vectors. In a way, it's, um, it's really some technique that we learned to deal with the two-dimensional and three-dimensional space and objects in, in, in in two-dimensional and three-dimensional spaces. Um, it's very convenient because if you use vectors, you can, you can add them up. And um, we saw how by using this addition of vectors and also multiplication of vector by a scalar, we can represent all points along this line in one stroke, so to speak, we can, by, by, by this formula, R0 plus Vt. But if you wish, you can write everything in components. You can write R0 as some point as x0, y0, and z0. Now remember, this is a notation we use for vectors, this angle brackets, as opposed to the round brackets for, for, the, for, the, for the point. And it's not just you know, to be pedantic and to make uh, everyone's life complicated, but there is a, as I explained on multiple occasions, there is a big difference between vectors and points, right? For example, points we cannot add up, and vectors we can add up. So, but once you have a point, you can draw a vector from the origin to this point, and that's, that's the position vector. So essentially, it just means changing the round, round brackets by the angle brackets. 
And if we write V as A, B, C, then this formula can also be written in components just like this. So the upshot of all this is that all you need to know to write down an equation of, uh, of, a, of a line is a point on that line in the vector along this line. That's all. And once you know them, you put them in these very simple formulas. And that's, that's their parametric representation. So these are lines. General curves are more complicated the, in that these formulas which show up on the right-hand sides are more complicated than this. These are the simplest simplest f uh, uh, functions in one variable, linear functions plus a constant function. But in general, you'll have more complicated expressions like t squared or um, higher powers of t or uh, trigonometric functions or whatever. Okay? Nevertheless, no matter what your curve is, you can always approximate this curve by, by a line in the neighborhood of a given point. And that's, that's sort of the major one of the major ideas that we've discussed up to now. Which is linear approximation. Linear approximation. In other words, you can approximate complicated curvy objects by simple, linear ones, in the neighborhood of a given point. Not everywhere, simultaneously, not everywhere at once, but in the neighborhood of a given point, you can do that. And what, it, what this amounts to, in the case of curves, is finding tangent, um, tangent lines, tangent vectors and tangent lines. So for curves, this means finding tangent lines, tangent vectors and tangent lines. to general curves. And I want to emphasize, at a given point, because if you change the point, of course, the tangent line is going to be different. So let's say here, a curve could be something could be complicated like this, and then this would be the tangent line. So the curve itself could be given by these equations, x equals f of t, y equals g of t, and z equals h of t. And uh, there will be some value t0, which will correspond to, x, to point x0, y0, and z0. That's a point on this curve. And then you can be asked to uh, to write down the equation for, tangent, for the tangent line at this point. And the way you do this is by taking the derivative of the vector function which is obtained by combining these three functions. So the tangent vector v would be just um, um, x prime of t at, t at t0, y prime of at t0, and z prime at t0. Or in other words, what we can call r prime of t0. And once you have this v, okay, then you can write down the equation of this line. So this is a tangent vector. This is a tangent vector. And the tangent line will then be given by the equation r is equal to r0, r0 being again as before being um, the point between the, the position vector of x0, y0, and z0, plus this v times a parameter. And this, at this point, you just, I want to emphasize that there is no reason to use the same parameter t. In fact, it's better not to use the same parameter t because if you use it, it kind of, you're kind of um, implicitly suggesting as though this were the same parameter as the parameter for the original curve, which it is not. The tangent line, and the curve are unrelated, except that just in a very small neighborhood of this point, they are very close to each other. So here, it is much better to, to emphasize the fact that they are unrelated and to use a different parameter 
for example, can use the letter S. So it's, it's a different. But I want to emphasize, I want to emphasize that this is a different parameter. Okay. Is that clear? Okay. Question. Oh yes. Yeah, well, so, so what this means is, this means the derivative evaluated at t0, right? That's what I mean. After that, I take this v, uh -huh. this particular v, and I, I write the equation in this form. I, I want to call it s. You can call it some, anything else, any other letter you like, but I want to emphasize, I, that it shouldn't be the same as t, because then it's confusing, because then it looks like there's some connection between the two, the two curves, so the curve itself and the tangent line, right? But there isn't a connection. The, the, think of this parameter t, say, as a time, time which, you know, the, the time along the curve. So let's say there is a, there is a bug which is, which is uh, traveling along this curve, and uh, at this function, this position functions f, g, and h at, at, would correspond to the position of that bug at the, point, at the time t, right? But then there is another bug which is traveling along the, the tangent line, and these bugs don't know each other. The only thing is that they kind of, <laughs> they don't even necessarily come in contact with each other, right? Because, because you see this point, because when, when one of them is here, the other one could be somewhere else, right? Because they, they, just live, they have different time scales and different time, you know, different clocks. So, so on this curve, this point corresponds to t equal t zero, right? But on the tangent line, this, this point corresponds to s equal zero. Right? Because when s is equal to zero, the second term drops out. Vs drops out. So what you have is just r zero. So the second bug, is here when, when his or her time shows uh, zero, right? Whereas the other one is here at the time t zero. And so there's no, there's no connection between the two. The point of tangent line is to have a line which is the simplest curve, simplest possible curve, approximating in the best possible way our original curve in the neighborhood of that point. But it doesn't mean that when we parameterize them, that the parameterizations themselves should be related to each other. You see what I mean? Okay, any other questions? So, um, so these are, these are tangent lines. And by the way, the, this includes, for example, the issue of the slope. When we talked about parametric curves at the beginning, when we talked about parametric curves on the plane, we didn't talk about tangent lines. We, didn't, we talked about the slope of the tangent line. But of course, the slope of the tangent line can be easily found in the case of a curve, in the case of a line on the plane from these equations. Okay. So that's more or less the outline of, uh, of the material that we learned about curves. There is one more sort of a subtopic here, which is applications of curves. So there are various kind of quantities we learned uh, how to compute related to curves. So there are various integrals, more precisely. Various integrals. So you've got, you've got the arc length. Right, you've got uh, area under the gr uh, under the curve, or and area enclosed by by some by some curves. Enclosed area, let's call it this way. Area, and also surface. Uh, revolution surface area. So these are there are various integrals which you can set up. Are related to curves, and this, and of course, this is something you need to know that there's various formulas involved here. Okay, but that that takes care of 
of the one-dimensional objects on the plane and in space. As, and as you see, I kind of organized all this material in, under one umbrella topic, uh, whereas, in fact, we studied, we studied this material in a slightly different way, so not necessarily exa in exactly the same way. Because we first talked about planes and then three-dimensional space. But I want to emphasize the fact that actually th there is not so much of a difference. The, the, the way curves are on, on the plane and in space is actually very similar. <coughs> revolution surface. I didn't want to say the word revolution. You know. The big brother is watching. <laughs> so I want to be careful. But you know what I mean. OK. Now, next, next is surfaces, right? So these are one-dimensional objects. And next, we talk about surfaces. Surfaces are two-dimensional objects. And surfaces live in R3. Because we can't fit, you can't fit a you know, basketball in a, on a plane, in a, in a, plane, in a two-dimensional space. It has, to be, it has to live in a three-dimensional space, dimension one higher. So what about surfaces? So surfaces, as far as the representation of surfaces, is they are given by one Cartesian equation. They are given by one Cartesian equation. So remember, for for curves, they are given by one parameter, parametric form, or they we have to use we have to do two two equations in R three. But now, for surfaces, it's the other way around. We need the one equation, but if we, if we want to do a parametric form, we'd have to choose two parameters. So that means that it's more economical to use Cartesian equations uh, to describe a surface by an equation as opposed to using parameters. So, but I, 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 leave it as a, I leave this as a little note. We need two parameters, two parameters now. And in fact, this is something we will do later on in this course when we talk about uh, various double and triple integrals. We will have to parameterize curves. But for now, we don't really, we don't really use this method. We exclusively represent uh, surfaces by equations, by a single equation, instead of writing uh, points on the surface by, uh, in terms of two parameters. And so what comes next is, um, Different examples, different examples of, of surfaces, right? And once again, once again, the simplest one, the simplest class is consists of linear ones, which are planes. Simplest class. Okay, so what do, um, what do we need to know to represent a plane? To represent a plane, we need a, we need a point and, uh, and, uh, and a normal vector. As, as I as you remember, we saw in one of the most memorable images from this course so far. You have a normal vector to this plane, and you have a point. And this is sufficient information to describe all the points on the plane. So let me draw it here. So this is a plane, and um, let's say this is a this is a normal vector. You can't see blue. Oh, so now I know when I when I want to leave a sublime mes sublime message on the board, I know which which uh, chalk to use. All right. So, which which do you see? The white. I, I hope you see. Although today the <laughs> today the board is very white. So it's. Let's see. I've got yellow and I got green. Green. green? green. Yeah, I think we sh we are all concerned about the environment, right? So. <laughs> Let's use green. Is that better? 
Okay. All right. So we we exile the blue we exile the blue chop. No more. Only when I only when I want to write something that you don't see. Now, so we have a normal vector. This is a normal vector. And again, we have a point. We need to, we need to choose a point. In both cases, lines and, and, uh, um, and planes. Now, this n, this n is usually written as ABC, but I, I don't want to write it as ABC because we already used ABC for, for, for lines. I just want to emphasize that this is a different type of vector. Okay? So let me write n d e f. Okay, and so then the equation, the equation of the plane is, is simply d times x minus x zero plus e times y minus y zero plus f times c minus c zero equals zero. Okay, so that's the equation which actually we we derived by using dot product in the first place. But I don't want to repeat this. This, this now is there is a very simple way to explain why this, this precisely represents all the points on the plane. So this is an equation on the variables x, y, and z, where where all other quantities are given. This is d, e, f are, are coordinates or components of the normal vector, so they should be given. And likewise, x zero, y zero, and z zero are the co coordinates of a point, and they should also be given. You can rewrite this by open, opening the brackets. Okay, so you can rewrite this by opening the brackets. So what you can do is you can isolate the terms with x, y, and z. So you would get dx plus ey plus fz equals something e, e, f, g, okay? Where, where g is x, e, sorry, d, x, 0, plus e, y, 0, plus f, z, 0. Right? So this is a number. This is a particular number. So the, the reason I'm, I'm writing this is sometimes you can be asked the following question. You're, suppose you're given a plane. Let's say you have a plane um, 4x plus y plus 3z equals 5. Okay. So, and you can be asked, what is a normal vector to this? What is a normal vector? So you just look at the equation and you see right away what the normal vector is. Because these are precisely the coefficients in front of the variables, x, y, z. These are the components of that vector. So for instance, you could be asked, here is the equation of a plane. Write down the equation, uh, parametric equations for, for the line which is, which is normal to this, to this plane and which passes through a particular point. So then, what should you be thinking? You should be thinking, what do I need to know to write down an equation of a line. To write down an equation of a line, I need a point and I need a, a vector, the direction vector. Okay, so the point, let's say, will be given. So th then how do I find out what the direction vector is? Well, the, dire the, the line is supposed to be, in this setting, supposed to be perpendicular. So the direction vector of the line is a normal vector of the plane. And now the point is that you can, find, you can see it right away when you look at the equation. It's four, four, one, three is a normal vector, right? So the, the equation contains all the information that you need. And that's how you can uh, always, that's how you, can, you should uh, approach this kind of problems. To write down the equation of a plane, you need to know the normal vector. But conversely, if you already have the equation of the plane, you can immediately find out what the normal vector is by just looking at the coefficients. Yes? What else would you need to do other than find a parallel line? Well, the same question as find a line parallel to the 
right? How would you li find the line parallel to? Well, so to, f to find a line, just to find a line parallel to a plane is not a well-defined question, right? Because there are many parallel lines to a plane passing through a given point, right? Let's say if, if you have a point somewhere here and, the, and you want to look, there is, a, there is a parallel plane to this plane passing through this point. So let's say this piece of paper would be, represent, would be part of that plane. But inside, inside that plane, there are many, many lines which you can always say are parallel to this plane. So you, so you can't be asked, write down the equation of a parallel line. You can be asked write down the equation of a parallel plane, you see. Now, that is actually a good question. Let's suppose, let's suppose you're asked to write down the equation of a, of a plane which is parallel to this one and which passes through, so parallel plane, passing through through the point One, two, three. It doesn't matter. I'm just uh, taking random numbers. Okay? What is the equation of that plane? Well, since this plane is parallel to the original one, they share normal vectors, right? The normal vectors are the same. So I might as well use the same normal vectors as for the original plane, which would be four, one, and three, right? So these two planes will have to share the left-hand sides I mean, of, the, of these equations. We'll have to have the same left-hand sides. The only thing that could be different is the right-hand side. And how do I find the right-hand side? Well, for that, I use the second piece of information. The second piece of information is that this plane contains this particular point. So for this particular point, the right-hand side should be equal to the expression I get when I substitute the coordinates of that point, right? If I substitute the coordinates of that of that point, I get four times one plus two plus three times three, right? which is what? Four plus six, four plus two, six plus nine, 15. So the equation is just four X plus Y plus three Z is equal to 15, whereas the original one, it was equal to five, right? In fact, so all the planes which have the same left-hand side but different right-hand side will represent planes which are all parallel to each other but they will pass through different points. Only one of them will pass through a particular point, for example, the point one, two, three. But it's very easy to find the equation of the plane which passes through that point by simply substituting the coordinates of that point on the left-hand side. Yes? So again, the, uh, fi finding, uh, there is not a single perpendicular plane to a plane, right? The, the, the condition of being perpendicular would, would uniquely define a line. A line, there's a, say, through a given point, there is a unique, through a given point on a plane, there is a unique line which is perpendicular to it. And we just discussed, to find that line, you just need to know the normal vector, but the normal vector you can find out right away, right, from this. Now, there is another question that can be asked, is suppose you intersect two planes, and find out the equation of the line, right? So that's a little bit more tricky. So here you have to take the cross product of the normal vectors. Right? So there are all kinds of, yes? If you're given a line, oh, okay, so that's very good. So the, there's a question also, another question that can be asked is relative positions of line and planes, right? So here, so, so this particular question I'm asked is about relative position of a line and the plane. So let's suppose you have, you're given an equation of a plane, dx plus Let's actually, let's take this one again. So 4x plus y plus 3z equals 5. And then suppose you have a line. So it's like 1, let's say 1 plus 2t. And then here will be negative 1 minus t. And z is 2 plus t. And so, so these are, typical, these are typical equations for a line and a plane. And you can be asked, say, do this line and plane intersect or are they parallel to each other? Because these are really the only options, right? If you, have a, if you have a plane and you have some line, the line either is going to intersect somewhere, this plane, 
or it's going to be parallel to it. Or actually, there is one more option where it actually may be part of this plane. And how do you find out? Well, it's very simple. You, you simply substitute this uh, parametric equations into this formula, and you see whether you can find a solution for t for this equation. If there are no solutions, it means that they never intersect, right? Hmm? If there is a solution, if there is a unique solution, it means they intersect at one point. And if the equation is satisfied for all values of t, that means it just belongs to it. So in this case, we'll have 4 times 1 plus 2t plus y plus, uh, sorry, plus negative 1 minus t plus 3 times 2 plus t equals 5. So we open the brackets, we get 4 plus 8t minus 1 minus t plus 6 plus 3t equals 5. So we get, hmm, did I make a mistake? 4 plus 8t, that's right. You, yeah, I hope you do it better than I, than I do on Thursday. 4 plus 8t, so okay, now we, so this, for t, we get these three terms. So that's, uh, that gives us 10. And 4 minus 1 plus 6 gives us 9, right? Equals 5, so 10t is equal to negative 6. So there is a unique solution, which is 6 ten, neg minus negative 6, ten, 6 over 10. What did I do? Oh, OK. <laughs> it's one of those days. So my, minus negative 4 over 10. But I'm glad that you're paying attention. That's a good sign. Uh, negative 2 over 5. OK. So um, what could happen is that it could happen that the, um, all the terms with t disappear. It could happen that they all cancel each other out. And then you get a number on the left-hand side and a number on the right-hand side. And then two things could happen. They're either the same, in which case it means that the equation is satisfied for all values of t, which means that the line belongs to the plane. Or it may be, say, something like 5 equals 6, which is wrong, which is false, and therefore the equation is not satisfied for any value of t. That means that they're parallel. <coughs> Someone was ask, wanted to ask me a question. Yes? I you answered your question. Oh, OK, good. So, um, but as you see, the most likely, in a generic case, in a, in a generic case, there will be some non-zero coefficient in front of t, and then there will be unique solutions. So generically, a line and a plane will intersect, but sometimes it could happen that they cancel out. All right, so where, where were we? I talked about simplest class of, of surfaces, namely planes, and various questions that could be asked about planes, but these are not the only surfaces that we have studied. We have also studied quadric surfaces, surfaces which are given by quadratic equations. OK? So the next, the next example is here. It is quadric surfaces. And for quadric surfaces, we have an uh, equation w uh, like this, except now we allow um, second powers, squares, x squared, y squared, also mixed products like x, y, or y, z. Okay? So what you need to know here is uh, uh, that we can, we can break, uh, that all of those quadric surfaces break into several major groups. Okay? And what and how to tell whether a given equation describes a surface in that group. And what are the sort of the quality features of that, of that group. So you, you've got here an uh, ellipsoids, and you've got hyperboloids of two different types, and you've got paraboloids of two different types, okay? So you have to be able to tell by looking at the equation as to what it represents qualitatively. You don't have to necessarily to, you know, to, you will not be asked to draw a, a, what is called a, Hyperbolic paraboloid. Okay, that's that, that's not that's not we don't 
that's not the goal to, kind of, to, to test your drawing skills. The goal is to see that you realize, you understand the difference between difference, different equations that describe quadric surfaces and what are the sort of salient features of different quadric surfaces. All right. By the way, when I talked about when I talked about quadric surfaces, I did not mention two important class, two important groups of, of quadric surfaces. So, in addition to the ones before, in addition to the ones discussed before, we have this uh, cylinders. We have these two classes. One is called cylinders, and c cylinders are are surfaces which um, in which which are described by equations in which one of the variables um, is not involved. So you could have, for example, x squared plus y squared equals 1. So the variable z is not present in the equation. And um, it's very easy to represent this. You just look, you just draw the corresponding curve on the plane, which, is, which corresponds to these two coordinates which are involved. In this particular case, it's a circle. And then you, sort, you, you, you take this, you think of this as a frame. And then you kind of, you move that frame parallel to the z-axis. And the surface you get by, sweep, uh, by, by sweeping, you know, which will be swept by, by, this, by this frame, by this curve, will be your surface. So that's, in this case, that's exactly the cylinder. Right. So that's why they're called cylinders, even though they, the, the original frame doesn't necessarily have to be a circle. It could be hyperbola, for example, or a parabola. So you, you'll get sort of a parabolic um, surfaces. You think of them as a kind of cookie cutters. You know that you just have a certain shape that you want to cut, and then and you make a cylinder out of that shape. So that's what those cylinders are. And this, and the second one is. Um, Second uh, class of surfaces, which we didn't talk about in class, but I want to mention because they're also important, are the cones. Okay, so the simplest example of a cone is given by this equation: z squared equals x squared plus y squared. And that's that's given by this. Um, by this picture. Well, it's sort of self-explanatory because it is called a cone and it, and it looks like a cone. Except it's sort of a double cone. When you draw it like this, it's a double cone in the sense that z could be both positive and negative. And there is a basic symmetry between the upper half of this cone and the lower half of this, plump, of this cone. If you flip the sign of z, the equation will not change because this, the square will kill that sign anyway. right? So that's why it has, two, it has these two parts. So these are the cones. OK, so planes and quadric surfaces are the two classes of, of surfaces that we have studied in, in, in greater detail than, the, than more general surfaces. And for more general surfaces, we have discussed linear approximation. So again, I want you to see, I would like you to, know, to see and appreciate this analogy. For curves, we talk about linear approximation of curves by tangent lines. And for surfaces, we talk about linear approximation of general surfaces by tangent planes. And just like in the case of, just like in the case of uh, tangent lines, we have a very efficient method for writing down the equation of the tangent plane. Right? So tangent planes. So what you need to know here is that if you have a graph of a function in two variables, z equals f of x, y, and you have a point, x0, y0, and f of x0, y0, which we'll call z0, then you should be able to write down the equation of the tangent plane to this to the surface at this point, okay. And the way you do it is uh, so the, it's actually very similar to the equation for the tangent lines. We talked about this last time, 
So the equation specifically looks like this. Where we, so we have two partial, two partial derivatives of the function f, f sub x and f sub y, evaluated at this point. This is the equation of the, this is the tangent plane of the tangent plane. To the graph. Okay. You can also be asked to write down the equation of a normal line, of a normal line to the, to, the, to the graph. What do I mean by a normal line? That's the line which passes through the same point and which is perpendicular to this tangent plane. Right? And we, ju I ju we just talked about how to write down equations of normal lines. You see, and for normal lines, what you need to do is you need to keep track of the coefficients in front of x, y, and z, right? So what are these coefficients? Let me, let me actually do it right here. So you see in this, if I, this is a nice way to write it, but if I want to write it in a way we usually write, I have to put all variables on the same side. So instead of writing like this, I would have to write f sub x, x minus x zero plus f sub y, y minus y zero. And then I would have to take the other guy to this side also. So that means the coefficient here is negative one. So what, so what is the normal vector then? That's this green, that this green vector that we talked about earlier. It's just um, f sub x x0, y0, f sub y at x0, y0, and negative 1. Right? So that's a normal vector. And now you can write down the equation of a normal line by using this as a direction vector for that normal line, right? What do we need to write down the equation of a line? We need to know the starting point, and we need to know the direction vector. Well, the starting point is given. It's x0, y0, and z0, where z0 is, again, just the value of the function at x0, y0. And then, and the vector, the direction vector is just this numbers, fx of x0, y0, fy of x0, y0, and negative 1. And then you have to choose a coordinate along this, time, along this normal line. And so let's again use s, as, as before, as a second, as some, but you can use, t. in this case, you can use t because we haven't used t in this, in this setup yet. So. Okay, so this is the equation of the normal line, or parametric representation more precisely of the normal line. So that's basically, that's most of the, that's like 90% of the material we've done. And then there are, what we've also did last week, last week we started to discuss uh, various aspects of the, of the just general aspects of differential calculus. And uh, the first topic we discussed here were lim uh, was limits, right? So I kind of have to, it doesn't quite fit in either surfaces or lines, so I'd have to start. I would, I would have to start a different, a different topic. That would be three. Right. And so that would be elements of the differential calculus. This is something which we will continue to work on um, for the next couple of weeks. And here we have limits. We talked about limits, different aspects of limits, and continuity. And then we also talked about partial derivatives. Uh, 
And finally, we talked about the differential. Although the differential, the notion of differential is, of course, as I explained in great detail last time, it's very closely related to the notion of tangent plane. Tangent plane is a graph of the differential. So if you understand tangent planes, you understand the differentials as well. Okay? So that's, that's roughly the summary. That's some summary of the material we've done so far. And now we have a few minutes left, so you can ask me questions. Any questions? Will there be epsilon delta proof proofs on the exam? The answer is no. There will be no epsilon delta proofs. But you have to know, as you can see on a, on a mock midterm, there's a question about showing that the limit does not exist. Right? So you should be able to, to give an argument why it does not exist. Yes? What about proving that the limit does exist? That would be only in the case when it can be reduced to a one-dimensional case and where you could use one of the results from one-dimensional calculus. Okay. On the mock midterm, number four. Okay. So it, it will take, uh, so it will take me some time, so maybe I will, let me ask, let me see if somebody has sort of a shorter question and then I will get back to this. Is it okay? All right, so you were asking. I don't know if mine's going to be shorter, um, but could you give an example of showing, proving that a limit does exist, like showing reducing it down to? Oh, well, th there is one problem. Uh, so the question is, uh, what, uh, what kind of problems for existence of a limit uh, should we know? Um, a good example is a problem on the homework in that section where the limit can be written in polar coordinates. So the function could be written in terms of x squared plus y squared, and then it becomes something like r squared times logarithm of r. So that's exactly the kind of example I, I have in mind. Nothing, nothing not else. About, like, the no, no, not, not squeeze theorem. Okay. Go ahead. Will there be true and false questions? Possibly. <laughs> S represents a parameter of, uh, S is a parameter. It could be, you could use letter T, for example. Okay. Hyperbolic. Oh, you, uh, hyperbolic uh, trigonometric functions, you mean. No, you don't need specifically to know them. It's okay. Yes? I'm sorry? Polar drawings. Would you, the question is whether you would have to sketch polar drawings. Polar drawings are, are fair game because we, um, we, stu we studied them in class, right? And there have they, been, been lots of them in homework. Of course, I will not ask you to do something incredibly complicated, but something very basic like r equals cosine theta, r equals cosine two theta, r equals one plus cosine theta is something that you definitely should be able to do, right? Okay. Say again. Yes. I see. I don't. I don't understand the question. Yeah, I th actually, you know what, guys? I, I don't know. Maybe it's not a good idea. Maybe you would rather meet, prefer me talking, keep, keep talking, because I thought that, you know, that you might be interested in some of the questions your, your colleagues have, you know, because some of them might open something for you as well. So I, but if we cannot do it if people talk to each other. All right. Yeah, uh, I know in the homework you had things like x squared plus y squared, and say use that factor of r as those are Right. Can we use that same factor on the sketch that you have to? Is that still appropriate? Oh, you mean for? For limits, right? So for for the limits, uh, I already explained that you could have some the, on the homework. You have this function x squared plus y squared times something like this. I'm not maybe not exactly, but something very similar. Is that what you're asking? Yeah. So in this case, you should be able to explain why there is a limit when 
when x and y go to 0. Bec and the way you argue is by saying that in terms of polar coordinates, this is r squared times logarithm of r squared. And so it effectively, so the limit when x, y go to 0, 0 means that r goes to 0. So effectively, answering this question is simply equivalent to answering the same question, but for this function, one variable. And therefore, you can use the uh, methods of one variable calculus. And the method of one variable calculus here is the L'Hopital's rule, right? So you can easily do it by L'Hopital's rule. This is something you need to know. I, um, in principle, I, since this kind of problem was on homework, I, I, it is fair game. Okay. Yes, next. What exactly is perimeter? Parameter. What exactly is a parameter? In uh, parametric curves? Right. So the question is, what exactly is a, is a parameter in the parametric curves? Well, So um, to answer this, we look at the general curve, say, in R3, in space. OK? And what does it mean to parameterize it? Well, for me, the easiest way to think about it is as follows. So think of this, think of this curve as a, kind, as a rope, which is, you, which is some, somehow hanging in the, in the, in the air, OK? Like, here is, a, here is a curve, right? But it could be complicated like this. But if it, is, if it is a rope, you can always just stretch it. Just stretch it out and make it into a, a line, right? You can always just uh, straighten it out. Not stretch, not stretch, uh, straighten it out. That's what I mean. Just straighten it out and make it a straight line. When you make it into a straight line, you can introduce, measure, you can introduce measurement on it. You can just pick a point and say this point zero, and after that you'll have you know one inch, two inch, and so on. So you you, you can you can put a measurement on it. But if you could do that to the to this curve when you straighten it out, it means that so you can just mark mark each point. Each point will have a certain distance from a given point zero. So that's the parameter t. Then you think of then you put it back where it were, but now each point has a parameter. So that's what I mean by by, by parameter. You see what I mean? This is, this is like parameterizing. We are not surprised by the fact that we have uh, measurement, measuring instruments that they are parameterized. In other words, when we measure things, each point on this little ruler you know, is, has a marker. right? But th that's because usually we mark things on straight lines. So here we deal with something which is not straight. What I'm trying to explain is that there isn't so much of a difference between the two. Because even if you have a complicated curve, you can always straighten it out. And then you can view it, you can apply, you can apply the same uh, procedure to it as, as to a straight line. And so then you can mark each point by a certain, by a certain number, right? And that's this, extra, that's this extra coordinate, all right? Any, anything else? OK. That's a meta kind of a metaphysical question, philosophical question. <laughs> so are, are the going to be harder than the homework? Are, are the going to be harder than the homework? <laughs> on, on average, I think they will be about the same as homework. I mean, at least I aim them to be about the same level as homework, on average. But, it, it, but it's something in the eye of the beholder, right? What is harder and what is? They're not going to be much harder in any case. Same kind of problems. I think that the, mock, the reason why I, po I posted the mock midterm is precisely to give you an idea what kind of problems I would consider putting on the exam, right? So I think that gives you an idea. And speaking of which, let me go back to the question about uh, number four. Number four. I haven't forgotten. Number four on, uh, on the mock midterm.
I'm very, I'm very proud of this, of this question because it, it combines so many different things. It's too bad I cannot use it now in the midterm. But might be something similar. <laughs> I, I'm certainly not putting this problem in the midterm now after, after I explain it. But, okay, so let's calm down. So, do you want me? Do you want to hear the solution or not? Yes. yes. Okay. But then let's just let's 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 be, let's calm down a little bit. Okay. All right. So sketch. We have to first sketch this surface. So. So see, I'm going to do it now in real time because, of course, I don't remember. Uh, I don't remember what the surfaces look like, and I'm just trying to. I'm, I'm going to just to try to guess. So first of all, I see that there is one plus and two minuses, right? Right? And so, um, but I don't remember which one is it. Is it uh, double, with, uh, the one which, with two parts or with one part? So how do I tell? The way I would tell, of course you can, uh, you will have, your, one way to do it is to, to write it, all of this on your, on your cheat sheet. But then you, then you will be, using very valuable space for this, whereas in fact you can very easily deduce this by just looking at it. And what I see is if you take the y squared and z squared to the right hand side, so, so it's 1 plus y squared, 4 plus z squared, 4, right? So what you see is that this is greater than or equal to 1, right? It's greater than or equal to 1. So that means that if x, if x is between negative 1 and 1, there is no chance that I can solve this. Right? So that means there is a gap. That there is a break. The x equals, zero the x equals 0 plane, x equals 0 plane separates two pieces, two pieces of this graph. And now I see that this is a, it's a hyperboloid with two parts, right? So, and the x equals 0 plane is the yz plane. It's the yz plane. So that means this is one like this, which will be exactly at the point one. And the second one, which is at negative one, will be like this. <coughs> Um, like this, right? So that's the ba that's the way I would draw this picture. Now, well, there is this one over four, but just to sketch it, it doesn't really matter, right? So that's the first thing you need to do. Second, we want to compute the surface area of the part of the surface bounded by the planes x equal one and x equals square root of five over two. So here is x equals 1, and x equals square root of 5 over 2 is something which is just above 1. And why did I choose square root of 5 over 2? Because, because then if I look at the plane x equals square root of 5 over 2, I will get, and I intersect that plane and this hyperboloid, I will get a circle, right? And what is that circle? So it will be square root of 5 over 2 squared equals 1 plus y squared over 4. Well, we can just write it here. So this will be like 5 over 4 equals this, which means y squared over 4 plus z squared over 4 um, equals 1 quarter. So that means y squared plus z squared equals 1. OK? So that's, this, that's the circle. And now to compute the area, I want to represent this as a area as a surface of revolution. Revolution. Right? So <laughs> now revolution of what? Um, it will be a revolution of this of this curve in the in the XZ plane. Right? So I just have to draw this curve. 
Of course, you have to remember that I have to look at it not from this perspective, but from the back of the, of the blackboard so that x goes from left to right. If I look like this, x goes from right to left, but I want it to, look, to go from left to right. So actually, it's going to start at 1, and it's going to go like this, right? So in fact, what I want to do is I want to set, say, if you want, it could be, maybe it's better to do an xy plane. Let's do it an xy plane. So to do it in the xy plane, I have to put z equals 0 in this formula. So I put z equals 0, OK? And so what I get is x squared uh, minus y squared over 4 equals 1, right? So that's, that's actually a hyperbola. That's a hyperbola. Um, it's part of the hyperbola. So what I'm saying is that I want to go from 1 to square root of 5 over 2. And then this, the, the formula for the, the formula for um, For the, um, for the surface area is going to be 2 pi y, right, 2 pi y times square root of dx dt squared plus dy dt squared dt. So this will be from, well, I have to take from alpha to beta where I would have to write some parameterization for it. I would have to write some parameterization for this for this curve, and um, as x is some f of t, and y is some g of t, right? And so t will be from some alpha to beta, and um, right? And then I will have to take this integral. Does everyone agree with this? Okay. So now, um, the only thing I think I'm afraid that I'm out of time. So I'm saved by the bell. But so I feel, I feel as though I should let the people go, but I will be happy to continue and explain the rest after a five-minute break while, during the office hours, okay? So, so let's stop here, and uh, um, good luck on Thursday. So I'll see you on Thursday at 3.30. Exam starts at 3.40. And now we have office hours.